Very good to have your company and watching Round Table with me, David Foster. Are life's odds stacked against black Americans from the very start because of so-called white privilege? In fact, not just in the United States, but everywhere. In the wake of George Floyd's death, we'll be asking in this and subsequent programs why black lives seem not to matter when it comes to those things that so many of us take for granted. Health, education, employment, bottom of any list. Jail time, top. After protests going back to at least the middle of the 20th century, why has so little changed? Black lives matter! George Floyd, the black man whose death in police custody set off a wave of global Black Lives Matter protests and has begun a debate about racial justice and equality. In the US, black people are three times more likely than white people to be killed by police. 99% of killings by police in the US from 2013 to 2019 have not resulted in officers being charged with a crime, according to the group Mapping Police Violence. 77.1% of US police officers are white. Some argue this ability of white police officers to escape punishment is the epitome of white privilege in America. According to the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center, white privilege is the unquestioned and unearned set of advantages, entitlements, benefits and choices bestowed upon people solely because they are white. Campaigners say there is evidence of it in most vital areas of life in America. Historically, the unemployment rate for black Americans has been approximately twice the rate for whites, and they are over twice as likely to live in poverty as white Americans. And health outcomes are worse too. Black Americans are dying of COVID-19 at three times the rate of white people. After being filmed kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, Officer Derek Chauvin has been charged with second-degree murder. The three others face charges of aiding and abetting murder. Racial inequality is not just a problem in the United States. So is the world now more aware of white privilege thanks to the Black Lives Matter protests? Well, later in the program, we'll be hearing from Nakima Levy Armstrong, a civil rights attorney in Minneapolis, USA. That is where it all started with George Floyd's death. And from London, Patrick Vernon, political commentator and cultural historian of black UK history. But first, very pleased to say uh, we're joined both in the United States, first in Missouri by Douglas Flo, assistant professor of history and African-American history at Washington University. And in Texas, Johanna Luttrell, author of White People and Black Lives Matter, Ignorance, Empathy and Justice. Great to have both of you on the programme. Johanna, let me come to you first of all, because we are talking here about white privilege. Is it the same as racism? It, it can be because white people exhibit their privilege by racism and a being racist and um, uh, anti-blackness. So it can be, um, and it's one way to describe it. I think it's more useful to describe white privilege as racism. Um, because white people can say, we can, I will talk as we as white people, we can say that we're privileged, but it's harder for us to say that we're racist or we're anti-black, but it's more important for us to say that we're racist or anti-black. But, 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 but is it unconscious rather than overt? It can be both. Um, there's unconscious bias and there is um, overt racist policies that um, prevent black people from thriving. So both. Do you recognize this? It's from Lee Edwards, who's a, a professor at the Department of Media and Communications, London School of Economics. And she's writing from a white woman's perspective, once again, quotes, it is the ability to represent Greece rather than grit, moving smoothly through the world. It is the ability to make people feel comfortable. The knowledge I am approved of the ability to see myself in the world around me, it tells me I belong. It is the reason why I am safe while George Floyd was not. Do you get that? I do get it. Um, and I think that's more or less correct. 
But I think as white people, it's not enough for us just to recognize our privilege because that is one more form or can be one more form of white quietism to say, I'm privileged, I know I'm privileged, I don't understand black experience. And then that conversation is over with. But I think at this moment, especially, um, and at moments in our history before, especially in the United States, it's important for white people not only to recognize our privilege, but to act and be in solidarity with black people, black led political protests. And that means risking our bodies, um, sacrificing our time, sacrificing our money. And it's doing a little more than admitting of white privilege. Because if I'm only admitting white privilege, admitting that it's easy for me to move around in the world, to walk around in the world, to move smoothly in the world, then I'm not doing anything. Douglas, let me, let me come to you, if, if I may. 1988, a, a woman who became one of the best known anti-race campaigners uh, in the United States, Peggy McIntosh, wrote from a white woman's perspective 50 reasons why she felt safe and other people who were black did not. Some of them are so banal. I must read some of them out to you. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. My culture gives me little fear about ignoring the perspectives and powers of people of other races. Do you recognize that? Yes, uh, definitely. I, I think it's um, it's very important to recognize that the whole idea of white privilege is a comparative, right? Uh, it's not to say that whites don't have issues or face hardships. All humans uh, face hardships. Uh, but it's to say that we have to recognize the comparative differences in the experiences of groups in America based upon race. Um, and so definitely there are a, a variety of historical factors that have, to some varying extents, um, hobbled African-Americans um, in ways that uh, white uh, Americans haven't, haven't had to deal with. Um, so the, the protesters are responding to a deep reservoir of intergenerational trauma um, that comes from the feeling that, as you've said, you know, there are certain spaces that you, that you might move through uh, that because of color, you feel less comfortable, you feel less safe, you feel surveilled, you feel scrutinized. Um, this is a subject that I address in my book, um, Uncontrollable Blackness, which just came out recently. The first chapter is about spatial control in, in New York, uh, uh, which is where the city is, is based, and how African-Americans very often felt like they were, they were walking through a gauntlet in order to traverse the city. Um, and so, so there are a lot of ways in which uh, spatially, and then therefore psychologically, and then therefore economically, and on and on and on and so on, um, that African Americans have felt that that pressure. And I think that 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 is just one of the many ways in which um, the idea uh, the idea of white privilege actualizes itself in physical. Yeah. Form. So, so so white. So Joanna referred to white quietism. Douglas, for you, in what way? Do white people have to change for that to be over? One of the things that I think is very interesting about this particular protest, you know, I've been asked by a number of people whether or not this is a watershed moment. And I think that if it is, one of the things that uh, we can look at is the, 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 the shade of the protesters, right? I mean, there are so many different people in, in these protests, and many of them are, are white um, and it's it's interesting. It's it's very heartening. It's uh, very optimistic for me to think that there are some uh, white Americans who are willing to, even if momentarily, uh, shed their white privilege for the for the purpose of protesting something that um, you know. Practically, many people might think only really affects African Americans. I mean, ultimately, what needs to happen is that more white people uh, should recognize that what's happening in one part of the social and economic uh, and political corpus is going to ultimately also affect them. Um, that is, white privilege is, it, is yes. Sorry, I, I I won't interrupt again. But is it possible? This one's for Johanna. That. Um, white people thought that racial equality had been achieved to some extent and therefore what you call the quietism was was not something done deliberately it was just okay we've come so far everything's okay yes um for sure and so i think in mid-century in the united states um there was what we refer to as classical racism which means hatred in the hearts and minds and it was very overt and then that shifted in the 80s and 90s to an expectation that we all be colorblind um, because, and in the 2000s as well, um, because there's this expectation that we 
um, have already achieved racial equality here, um, that the civil rights movement has already happened, that we've elected our first black president. And so if we've already achieved racial equality, it's impossible that injustice based on racism is still happening. And so that's a way not to see white privilege and to see what's happening. But now I think that's shifted, um, uh, especially with the, late, the 2016 election, we understand, more white people understand that racism exists in the United States. We're shocked by it um, earlier, uh, but now- Well, well I mean, 2016 action. election saw somebody installed in the Oval Office who's been described as the most racist president um, that America has had. And, and whether people think it's passed or not, I'm, I'm going to put up a list in just a second, uh, Douglas, it's mostly for you, I would think, uh, of well-known black moments and those that are racially motivated that are not quite so well-known. Let's start with Rosa Parks, 1955. Alabama arrested for refusing to give a seat to a white teenager, Martin Luther King. Shot and killed Tennessee, 1968. Tommy Smith and John Carlos, 1968. Again, later that year, Black Power salutes at the Mexico Olympics. We remember these moments. A lot of people do anyway. But there's a long list, too, that many may not be so familiar with. 1964, James Powell, black teenager, shot by police in Harlem. Rioting followed. 1980, Arthur McDuffie, black, former Marine, killed in Miami. Four police acquitted, 18 dead in riots. 92, Rodney King, filmed being beaten by police in Los Angeles, officer acquitted, 60 dead in riots. Eric Garner, New York, 2014, put in a chokehold by police officer, died saying, I can't breathe. The officer's now suing for unfair dismissal. Freddie Gray, 2015, Baltimore death ruled, homicide charges against six police dropped, and then we have George Floyd. Again, I can't breathe. So if white people thought that racial equality had been achieved, how come these incidents, Douglas, keep on happening? The critical race theorists uh, would say that we, um, you know, that all we have seen over the time since the end of slavery in the, in the 19th century was uh, the recreation over and over of uh, racial caste systems, right? Slavery itself was a racial caste system. And afterwards, we had Jim Crow and all of the different laws of segregation and the codes that governed African-American bodies and lives. And uh, when, when we see that Jim Crow starts to break down during the civil rights movement, we start to you know, feel optimism that things will, will, will go to a place of equality. And uh, you know, critical race theorists would say, no, well, what we've seen is that there's just been a recreation of uh, the racial caste system over and over. And yet, and of, I'm sorry to hurry you, you, you believe okay. this time what happened to George Floyd may change something. I'm sure a lot of people think that every time something like this happens, but why in this instance do you feel that way? Yeah, well, I think uh, I think this goes back to the question that we we asked, uh, we talked about just a minute ago. Um, one of the things that's really hopeful is to see so many white people involved, right? So, which which might uh, uh, give us the idea that there is some sort of shift in the way that people are thinking about these things. George Bush recently made a, a statement in in support of of the uh, the protesters. Uh, George Bush is one of the most recent law and order presidents, so that's this is something that might that we might give us the idea that there's a shift in the way people are thinking. Um, um, but also, I, I think um, this is a very interesting moment for us to find um, ourselves talking about the issue of police violence right in the middle of a pandemic, which has affected the lives of every single American and forced us into a, a position of, of listening and paying attention to the fact that our lives are so intrinsically connected. Um, obviously, I, I, you know, I, I, I keep my optimistic uh, held back a little bit with the fact that I know we've seen these instances happen very frequently. In my book, I... I I mentioned an instance in 1994 that, that when is an African American. No surprise. I'm sorry to have to cut you short, but we have other people we have to bring on to the program. Of Your course. thoughts have been absolutely fascinating. Uh, Douglas Flo and Johanna Luttrell, thank you both for joining us here on Thank Roundtable. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, let's now bring in Nakima Levy Armstrong, civil rights attorney in Minneapolis, where all of this started with George Floyd's brutal death. And in London, Patrick Vernon, political commentator and cultural historian of black UK history. Good to have you both on the program. Uh, Nakima, let me come to you first of all. One of our previous guests said he was quite pleased to see 
so many white people taking part in the protests. And he felt that this might be an acceptance that white privilege had gone on for too long and that it was perhaps now being recognized that the only way uh, to end the sort of injustices that we've seen is for everybody to come together. Is, is that happening where you are? Yes, there are quite a number of white people taking place, um, sorry, taking part in demonstrations that are happening here. It's been going on for the last five years as we have been fighting for justice on behalf of victims of police violence. Of course, the fight has gone on longer than that, but we caught the energy of what happened from uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, and we've been demonstrating and protesting ever since. However, I want to make it clear that it is actually easy for white people to show up at a protest. It's much more difficult to get white people to use their power, their privilege, their influence, their political, social, or economic capital to fight for justice on behalf of black people over the long haul. I mean, right now, of course, everybody's taken to the streets. If you're not taken to the streets, people are questioning whether or not you care about justice. But I think that the bigger test is what you're going to do after this to try to affect change. So do you think it's a form of tokenism, perhaps tokenism as uh, Minneapolis City Council saying it's going to dismantle the police department? It's absolutely tokenism because our city council members, as well as our mayor, were put on notice several years ago that there were significant problems with our police department. As a matter of fact, they've settled tens of millions of dollars in excessive force and wrongful death lawsuits over the years, while not uh, simultaneously pushing for reforms um, within our police department. And so it's hypocrisy right now for them to claim that they care, for them to show up at George Floyd's memorial. There's an image of our uh, mayor uh, kneeling on the ground, crying next to George Floyd's casket. It is a spectacle, from my perspective, based on having shown up at um, city council meetings over and over again, having one-on-ones with these individuals, working with other activists, having to shut down meetings in freeways and streets just to get their attention. And finally, it took this moment where the world is watching for them to claim that they care about doing the right thing. So, so you, you say claim that they care. Is that it, in your opinion? There, there is no real appetite for proper change. They are just saying the right thing and doing the right thing for the circumstances. Absolutely. I think that they're ashamed uh, that George Floyd's murder was caught on camera because keep in mind, other people have died on their watch over the last few years. There has been no justice. Those officers have not been held accountable. As a matter of fact, in the history of the state of Minnesota, only one officer has ever been convicted of killing a civilian. And that was a black Muslim Somali man who killed an affluent white woman uh, while on duty. That, that particular officer was fired, he was arrested, he was charged, and he was convicted. Most of the officers who kill people here are white men, and yet not one has been held accountable in all this time. So, no, I don't believe okay. that our city council is genuine. Let, let me go to you, Patrick. Uh, the U.S. Attorney General has said he doesn't believe there is systemic racism in the United States. And I read in the paper just before coming on air that uh, Number 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister's office, has quoted Boris Johnson saying he does not agree that this, the UK, is a racist country. Britain invented slavery. Britain created America. And I get that. I'm talking about now. Sorry, Patrick. I want to bring you right up to date. Boris Johnson says he does not believe that this is a racist country. In other words, that the majority of people in the United Kingdom are not intrinsically racist. Even though they may be white privileged people, a lot of them, they are not racist by nature. I was trying to give you a history, a short history lesson there to explain. Unfortunately, the, it's only a 20 minute program. Yeah, I know. The, the, but the foundation of racism and discrimination is built in the history of Britain, which is reflected today. So what we see in America, and it comes back out in, in Britain, why the reason why there's a massive outpouring in the UK, tens of thousands of people demonstrate and give solidarity to George Floyd's family. It's about our own injustices. I can remember one particular case in the hometown I grew up in Wolverhampton uh, in the West Midlands near Birmingham uh, of a black man called Clinton McCurbin. He died in similar circumstances to George Floyd. This was in 1987. And guess what he said as he was dying? I can't breathe. 
that was over 30 years ago please, in the please, UK. Please, 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 may I come back to your view on whether the UK is intrinsically racist, something that is denied by the Prime Minister. It's pretty pertinent to this discussion about white privilege. If you look at key institutions in Britain, such as the current, current government, they haven't got a black minister in the current government, in the cabinet. If you look at the judiciary, there are hardly any black judges. If you look at the NHS, which is the biggest employer in Britain, employed 1.3 million people, there's hardly any senior black people at senior management level, either in director of nursing, medical director or chief executive. But let me put it this way, that may well be because of unconscious bias, white privilege, as opposed to racism. It's which is it's over. You, you can't make a distinction. White, what, white privilege is on the same is on the side of the coin of racism, discrimination, basically. That you know that we ha we have legislation. We've been campaigning for the last fifty years for race equality legislation, ranging from the nineteen sixty five Race Relations Act to uh, when Stephen Lawrence was murdered in nineteen ninety three. That led to the McPherson Report and the 2000 Race Relations Amendment of the Act. And the reason why we have this legislation, which have not been actually enforced by this current government, is because we have structural racism. The, on the statute books in Britain, we have a definition of institutionalised racism, but people don't use it, they don't, they don't, they don't they're not effectively taken forward. And it's only been a result of COVID-19, where there have been a disproportionate number of deaths of black and Asian people in Britain, and more recently, the recent outpouring of anger in Britain around Black Lives Matter, that all of a sudden the government's saying, oh, they, we don't have racism. We've had racism. And, and you think it's tokenism again, that the white people are joining black people in protesting here, or not? Well, well, not completely. Yeah, well, maybe to a certain extent, but I can remember that a lot of white people have been involved in some of the struggles uh, over the years. If you look at the history of uh, Rock Against Racism, that was, that was established in the mid-1970s by musicians, white musicians, who saw fellow white musicians, such as Eric Clapton, doing a, 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 a Nazi salute at a concert. And that led to lots of white people saying, this is not right. And, that led, and the Rock Against Racism has played a key role around influencing youth culture and music culture. I think the key issue that we look at around this stuff, around tokenism, is important. A lot of black people are quite angry. We have internalised the racism discrimination of Britain for the last several decades. And when you have to look at the Windrush scandal, a scandal which publicly and which, which will be lost on an awful lot of our viewers but involve people from the commonwealth coming to live in britain and ha having to be sent home i'm sorry i'm gonna have to stop you there because i've got to go back to nikima on this one i'll give you a say on this too uh, patrick in a moment if i may i'm gonna bring up on the screen u.s police shootings uh, deaths per million uh, black people 1252 deaths this is over a five-year period but proportionately 30 per million Hispanic, 22 per million, white, 12 per million, and other four per million. So 30 per million in the black population were killed or by, by police in the United States. Dismantling the police department, changing laws as Congress uh, says it is maybe thinking of doing, making it easier to prosecute police, national registry of uh, offenders. Will that make any difference? It's hard to say whether it'll make any difference because I don't trust the people making the decisions. They've never had the best interests of black people in mind. They've never had the best interests of other communities of color in mind, nor the poor and most vulnerable members of our society. So we're declaring in Minneapolis, nothing about us without us. Just like we took to the streets to get their attention and to get us to this point, we're going to continue to demonstrate, disrupt, and demand justice wherever they are until they actually listen to what the people want and what the people need and until they're willing to look at data to inform best practices and not a knee-jerk reaction to another egregious police killing. Okay, uh, Patrick, let me come to you. Um, Nakima there was in charge of the local chapter of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. Bringing that back to the United Kingdom, would you accept there have been advances in, in the last 50 years and that perhaps it's subconscious that white people are allowing these things to continue or do you think the boot or the knee is still very much on the neck both physically and and metaphorically well i mean often people like to look at um how many individuals might have done successfully as individuals in their own right in terms of politics business world 
entertainment world, but you have to look at the data. The data in Britain is quite stark. The Equality to Human Rights Commission is now undertaking a major investigation looking at racial discrimination in Britain today. And the reason why it's doing that is because the evidence that's been collected over the last 10, 20, 30 years around police brutality, stop and search, overrepresentation in the mental health system, the impact of austerity and cuts on black communities has meant that racism has widened, discrimination has widened, and the inequality and poverty gap has also widened. We are we are out of time. Um, quite angry, I think, is an understatement. Patrick, we much appreciate your time. And Nekima from uh, where George Floyd uh, was uh, brutally suppressed uh, in Minneapolis. Thank you very much indeed, both of you, for being on this programme, and thank you very much for watching. Uh, this is one of the first in a series of programmes we're doing based around Black Lives Matter. This has been about white privilege. From me, David Foster, thank you for your company. We hope to have it next time. Goodbye for now.